I just want to gather some loose thoughts, first of all, about the, the context in which I was invited and that I quite don't understand. So my puzzlement is knowledge production, what is this? That is my first question. What do you mean by knowledge production? So since my interlocutors are not there, <laughs> I am addressing the room or I am addressing all of you. What do we mean with knowledge production? And what do we mean when we connect knowledge production with art? And um, what, we do, what do we need, if I read today's program, by the hypothesis that artists are to be regarded as intellectuals? And uh, Maria just mentioned artistic research as, as one of those problematic, problematic uh, expressions. Everybody knows uh, Picasso's famous uh, words, je ne cherche pas, je trouve. Uh, I, don't, I don't do research, I find. Ich find, ich such nicht, ich find. So, um, it, is, it, it, it sounds strange for me who have spent my professional life trying to think about art and, and turning art into theory of, of sorts, not just criticism, because I don't think of myself as an art critic. I think of myself more as an art historian and a theorist than an aesthetician. So I do theory. And it, it sounds strange for someone who does theory to come up and say, well, there is no such thing. There is no such thing as uh, produ producing knowledge, a knowledge production in art. And then I, I, I'm not sure of what I'm saying. Um, I'm really not sure of what I'm saying. Sometimes I do think that there is knowledge, that art produces knowledge, and sometimes I think it's not true. Um, today, I would tend to think that it is not true that art produces knowledge directly. When I was younger, I certainly was more confident in the idea that there was knowledge to be gained from art. I think there is knowledge to be gained from art, but that does not exactly mean the same thing as the idea that the art is producing knowledge, or that the artist is producing knowledge. All these paradoxes will somehow be addressed in my talk, I realize. It's, a, it's an old talk, I have done it. It was not meant as a talk in, uh, to begin with. It was a piece that was asked by Art Forum, <coughs> some more than 10 years ago. And um, they, they wanted to ask a number of art critics and people like me to reflect on their activity. So it's called Critical Reflections. That was the name, the title of the series. And there were other people in that series. So I, I, so I got to reflect on my own activity, which, is, which rarely happens. I mean, you know, uh, you, don't, you don't ask a, a sports person to reflect on what is tennis playing, for example. And all of a sudden, you have to dis dissect your own movements and begin to theorize about your own activity. I tend to theorize relatively easy about other people's activities, but not about my own. So this is a, a, a sort of strange text. So to come back to the idea of uh, knowledge production as, as a way of introduction to the, to the future debate, um, I think if production, then, it, then there is indirect production. It's the business of science to produce knowledge. Sometimes I even doubt that philosophy produces knowledge. Philosophy thinks, philosophers think, philosophers produce thought, they produce new ways of thinking, they change the way in which we look at things. It is clear that looking at the world after Descartes is not the same as looking at the world before Descartes. But has Descartes any, any, in any way produced new knowledge? I think that to say cogito ergo sum, that is not a new knowledge. That is a new thinking process, maybe, or, or the realization of a, a thinking process that was there all the time, but that nobody had put on the table explicitly the way Descartes had. But I doubt that it is new knowledge. New knowledge is like uh, scientific discoveries, for example, are new knowledge. Now, 
the job that I'm doing is nevertheless full of uh, knowledge and knowledge, knowledge acquire, acquiring and knowledge producing. Well, there's lots of things like empirical facts, for example, about artworks, where they are, they, they, they are uh, prone to be looked at as, as pieces of uh, knowledge, of course. So maybe I should not quibble more about this idea of knowledge. Uh, for example, uh, earlier on in my career, I had less doubts about that. For example, um, this is how, I will tell you a little anecdote, this is how I approached Duchamp. Because I've been quoted as a sort of Duchamp freak, which I'm not, <laughs> which I'm not really. Duchamp is not my favorite artist, but Duchamp is definitely the, the messenger of some huge change. In, in what art, well, in, let us say, in the art institution, basically. But at the time, it was 75, uh, so it was in the year 1975, and I stumbled on Duchamp quite by chance. I, I, I bought one book, uh, the, the big Arthur Schwartz book, which I got half price at some discount store. Then the same day, Jean Claire's book, Marcel Duchamp, Le Grand Fictif, that just came out. I, wanted, I bought it, and then two days later, uh, walking on, on, along the Seine in Paris, I found the entretien, the, the interviews with Pierre Cabat, which was out of print for a long time. And this got me into Duchamp. And three months later, after having, I'm, I'm burning here, <laughs> after having, I, don't, I know that you don't want to oh, okay. camera, so how do you do? So three months later, after having read, read everything I could on Duchamp and traveled to uh, Philadelphia to see the large glass with my own eyes and it on the day with my own eyes, I thought I had a theory. And the theory um, was not mine. And this is still my attitude today. The theory is not mine. The theory is not Duchamp's. The theory is in the work. And it was a theory of art. Now, it's 30 years later, and I'm still working on that theory of art that I think is being signaled by Duchamp's work. Uh, I no longer believe that it is so naively in the work as I believe that it was in the work then. Um, I, in, in a nutshell, the theory was at the time, in 75, anything can be art provided there is an object, there is an author to that object, there is an audience for that object, and there is an institution that brings all these three ingredients together. This is, if you are interested, it's a more elaborate version of that little theory is to be found in chapter 7 of Cartes Tradition. I call it the mayonnaise theory today. Because, you know, it, it takes an egg, egg yolk, mustard, oil, and vinegar to make a mayonnaise, and then you can add salt and pepper and other things, but you have to have these necessary and sufficient conditions. So I thought I had put my finger on the necessary and sufficient conditions for art, and that these necessary and sufficient conditions were exemplified by Duchamp's ready-made not only exemplified, but also commented upon by the works of art. For example, I interpreted this little poster by Duchamp, Wanted, you know, you, you know that, where he, he appears as a criminal, wanted, blah, 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 and then many, many, many names, also known under the name Hook, Lion, and Sinker. And at the, if you know English, Sinker, it was written like that, but if you know English, to swallow it, Hook, Lion, lion and Sinker means like a fish who swallows the line, the hook, and everything, that is to be very naive. So, etc. So each work um, of, of Duchamp, each act of Duchamp, became a little piece in my interrogation of the work. But the, it is clear that if I had not asked these questions, the work would not have answered in such a way. So today, I am a little more um, uh, precautious even though I still believe that if there is knowledge, not knowledge, but theory, it's not the same thing, you see. Uh, it's, 
It's the way of theory is making sense of acquired knowledge. It's not the knowledge itself. It is that which, which explains the knowledge. You may say, well, it's another piece of knowledge. Yes, of course, you, you're adding that. But it's more philosophical in nature than scientific, and therefore maybe less knowledge production than simply uh, reflection, or reflective, or uh, critical, or uh, theory producing. So I still believe that the, the whatever meaning, teach, uh, or, or, or thinking process I have arrived at is in the work, but things have become a little more complex. So maybe I should read this text, and then we can, uh, maybe I will stop somewhere where it puzzles me, and then, and then um, maybe comment a little bit, and we can talk after that. So this was from 1995. Something came home to me some time ago when a friend and colleague said to me with a hint of irritation, oh, Thierry, you're really like an artist. You want to know who it was? Yes. It's Rosalind Krauss. <laughs> said, and she was really irritated. It was not a compliment. I had done something a decent professional art historian wasn't supposed to do, and her exclamation was a friendly blame, but I took it as a compliment. Only later did I ponder what she might have meant and whether I deserved the compliment, even if she hadn't intended it as one, and how embarrassing it was to have been made self-conscious about something I would rather have ignored. In any case, it was too late. I couldn't erase what I'd heard, and my friend's remark has stayed with me prompting me to respond probably much too personally to the invitation to reflect on the activity of the art critic. I feel bound to dissect what I do or what I think I do. The risk of self-delusion is enormous when I practice art criticism. There's, there is a kind of art critic, the poet critic, who can legitimately claim to be an artist, but I'm not it. I would never call what I do art or poetry. I wouldn't even call it art criticism proper. My writing is theoretical, which means that I expect some scientific or philosophical truth from it. This inevitably means that when I approach a work, I come to it equipped and encumbered with a combination of knowledge and ignorance inherent in the theoretical apparat apparatuses that I've learned to use or have partially forged myself. My work is situated within the boundaries of a practice that seeks explanation, not invention, critique, not poetry or art. What is it now that prompts me to write on a given work or body of work? I need to like it, that's the first thing. Or perhaps not. To like is too weak. To love is better, but a bit misleading. What I mean is that I need to feel that the work calls me. I have so I'm sometimes tempted to write on works I hate, but which call me all the same. I never have, mostly because I lack the courage to openly antagonize the artist or other critics. I never write on works that leave me indifferent, though, and the very fact that I write on this or that work is in itself a sign that I have a strong relation to it, as it is for most critics, I suppose. But to decide that a work calls me strongly enough to give it a lot of time and energy is a complex process. Love at first sight usually doesn't last, unless it turns out not to be just love at first sight. Most often, once a minimum level is reached, the works that trigger the desire to write about them are those I really don't know whether I'm in love with it or not, or from which I get a, a, a strong enough conviction that this is precisely what draws me to them. Without the sense that the work breaks the consensus that I have with myself, the impetus to write is just too weak. I want to emphasize that. A very often, I think it's a good sign when you don't like a work too much but you are drawn to it, you know, it's, and, and you have, you, it, something is wrong, and something, you want to know why you're attracted and at the same time rebelled. That's a good, 
uh, arousal of your curiosity. This first step is intuitive, unwilled, unguarded, a gesture of surrender to the work. Yet it is at the same time utterly self-conscious and reflexive. When I approach a work, I try to do this without pretending that my taste is unprejudiced, but to the contrary, keeping the prejudices of my taste in check by adding to them another prejudice, my taste for works that compel me to go against the grain of my taste. Call me a perverse formalist, if you want. I prefer to say that ethics enter the picture here. Prejudices are totally instinctive and are pervaded with biases of all sorts, and mine include the prejudice that controls the others. The ethical move is to trust them all with no outside watchdog. That was a bit pretentious. I wrote that 10 years ago. Having decided that I'm definitely drawn to a given work, a second requirement must be met before I set out to write on it. I must feel it is going to teach me something theoretical. Contemporary art is full of works which ex with explicit theoretical content. They usually bore me to death. These works are readily understood, provided you know the right code. They generate easy consensus among people who speak the right jargon. And more often than not, they stake their maker's claim to a position of power in academia or the marketplace. To understand them out of hand, is already to loathe them, as far as I'm concerned, because they merely illustrate some existent theory, as sophisticated and interesting as that theory may be. I'm interested only in works that I don't understand, and these may include works that I don't like, even works I hate. Interest in art is distinct from the love of art, but when there is love, it comprises interest. This is so, because not knowing whether or not I like a given work and deciding that therefore I am drawn to it has everything to do with not knowing what the work means and deciding that therefore it ought to be significant. Not all works that escape my understanding achieve this, of course. There are those that are simply done and meaningless. There are those that I am desperately dumb about, or blind to. And there are those that I feel may be of genuine interest to other people, but that fail to trigger in me the kind of excitement I need to write. The sense of not understanding a work is not enough. What matters to me is a certain quality of puzzlement, of bewilderment, that sets the intellect in motion. I happily claim the word quality here, together with all its aporias. Quality is something you feel inside you, and that therefore is merely subjective, yet that you ascribe to the work you are dealing with as if it were objective. I called it excitement a minute ago, and I know it when I feel it, but I cannot convey to you a sense of what it is even though I presume that you know excitement for yourself. I'd have to show you a work I deem exciting and ask you if you feel the same way. Even if you answered yes, you and I might be talking about quite different experiences. I stress this because I want to make the point that even though I approach art out of intellectual curiosity, the arousal of that curiosity is itself aesthetic. To me, it is even the aesthetic experience, the one I value the most, the one that gets me going. It is a feeling that the work contains knowledge unknown to me. The feeling and its quality are highly personal. Yet the presumption is that the work, I say the work, not the artist, knows something that I don't know yet and that my task is to unearth and make explicit the theoretical, theoretical thinking that's implicitly going on in the work. Of course, I realize that objects don't think. 
and that whatever thinking I draw from the work must be attributed either to the artist or to me. Not only methodologically, but also ethically speaking, however, this is not how I proceed. The work is the site of the thinking. That's my rule of thumb, but also my postulate. Without this postulate, the thinking in question would not be aesthetic or artistic, if you prefer. And it has to be aesthetic if the object under scrutiny is to be a work of art. This is a very important point. I don't know what this means yet, but it's an important point. A, a scientist doesn't think the same way. So there is a, there's a postulate that there is that the work does the thinking. But of course, if the work is ready made like a piece of like this glass, it has no brains. It cannot do the thinking. And yet, this is that kind of thinking is precisely what what triggers perhaps a aesthetic as opposed to intellectual or a scientific or even philosophical a process of thinking. Good. Far from guaranteeing the objectivity of my reading, this postulate, that the work is the site of the thinking, renders it vulnerable, my reading, to my prejudices. Again, the ethical move is to trust them, Better admit that you are not universal and that your ability to pose questions is limited, provisional, sometimes utterly circumstantial. Yet, if as an intellectual you don't trust the questions you ask yourself, you might as well quit. Caring about your own doubts is what readies you for particular encounters with particular works of art. When they arrive, a flash of recognition occurs something immediate, more often delayed, sometimes excuse me, sometimes immediate, more often delayed, nachträglich, Freud would have said. And what you recognize without cognizing it is your momentary blind spot. I have never approached an artwork or a body of work, or for that matter a cultural phenomenon, without a theoretical question in mind. Usually one having to do with some historical transformation in the notion of art. On the other hand, those questions, though framed by the concerns I share with my intellectual community, are never pressed on me from some theoretical heaven, but are proffered by individual works. In this I find the proof that I am not erring totally. That's again a little bit pretentious, but I will correct this later on. Once I've decided I love a work enough and feel it knows something I want to know badly, I'm ready to start. What happens is a dialogue. I address theoretical questions to the work, and the work answers or refuses to answer. The way it does or doesn't answer leads me to pursue my line of questioning or to shift ground, to refine the hypotheses I'm working with, or to abandon them, to summon certain references and to dismiss others. That's the exhilarating part of my job, the time of truth and dare, the time when I'm really in bed with the time. Was the, was the film also uh, titled In Bed with Madonna? Yeah, in Europe, yeah. But in America, it's truth and dare. Better than Madonna is much better. <laughs> so it's a love affair and a struggle, a ceaseless intercourse with the work. And like intercourse, it's all about touching and being touched. I mean, if you aren't moved by the work, nothing happens. You aren't theoretically aroused. You go through the motions of theoretical love making, but you're numb. You simulate pleasure, perhaps, but your writing is dull. If the work moves you, touches you, then every theoretical question you address to it is a caress under which it quivers or shivers, yields or winces, and you soon learn which ones touch the G-spot, which ones hurt, which ones are merely irritating. Enough lyricism, 
If the lovers and art lovers of this world are still with me, I've made my point. Even if they don't get their kicks out of theoretical caresses of and from works of art as I do. The point is not to claim the right to my own little perversions, but to convey a sense that I am both that I both am and am not talking metaphorically. I said dialogue, and then I said intercourse. I said it's all about touching and being touched. Now I add it's all about talking and being talked to. Touch and talk are equally metaphors when it comes to our relations with things. But, as everyone knows, from looking in philosophical bewilderment at a ready-made or an Andy Warhol Brillo box, works of art are not mere things. They do touch and they do talk, which is why, incidentally, all cultures tend to treat at least their own artworks as quasi-living beings, quasi-persons, and why the defacing of a work of art is always a barbaric act. The unreality of the dialogue slash intercourse between work and critic, then, is not the conventional distance between reality and metaphor. It has to do with the fact that only through the interplay of dialogue and intercourse do I access the work's otherness and remoteness, in other words, the work, in as much as I don't understand it. This interplay could be described as a second-degree dialogue, or as intercourse at a remove. But these images are misleading, for they suggest a plane of meta-language where dialogue and intercourse are kept apart. In fact, it is the talking that does the touching, and vice versa. This is what makes art criticism such a strange and unique activity full of risks. I like that part. Now, in rereading myself, I like that. Uh, that, that <laughs> I think. No, I think there's something that you you you, you are. Of course, you when you say works about talk, it talks to me. Yeah, it doesn't talk like a painting doesn't talk. It's an object, or it moves me, it touches me, and it, it's not reaching out and actually touching you, but it 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 moves you. Yes, language is beautifully. Language is in itself metaphorical. When we speak of emotion, we speak of something that puts us in motion, even though I may stand still and not move at all. So, and, 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 and when you say somebody touches me, you don't necessarily mean that, that he's doing it with his hand or so. Somebody can be touching without actually touching. So I don't see why these words would be more metaphorical because we are dealing with objects than they are when we are dealing with people. And of course, objects are not people, but of course, artworks are, unless they are not art in my opinion, more than just mere objects. So, the art activity at this point, when it, when it is a dialogue, a so-called dialogue or, or, or quasi-sexual intercourse with the work of art is, of course, uh, very risky. And what the first risk, I'm reading again, to be overcome is the extraordinary narcissistic pleasure of this activity. That's inevitable since art criticism is reflexive. <coughs> the work is, after all, a thing. So when I ask it a question, I'm actually talking to myself. And when the work answers, I'm actually listening to myself, deciphering messages of uncertain origin. And when the work touches me, I'm reveling in my own emotion. That's not romanticism, that's fact. An embarrassing fact, I agree, but one that it's a lot more interesting to acknowledge than to deny because you can then see art criticism as involving a constant self-conscious reflexivity on what you're doing. Critical reflection is not a meta-discourse on your practice. It is imminent to it. You have to be constantly on guard against excessive identification and projection. 
You don't want to lose yourself in the work. And you don't want to take the work hostage. Here, ethics once again enter the picture. You have to know that you can't possess a work of art any more than you can possess a person. You have to respect its otherness. Keep yourself from wanting to assimilate it into yourself or to project yourself uninhibitedly inhibitedly yes, onto it. The difficulty is that the ultimate safeguard against the risk of bathing in your own feelings is your own feeling. And that it is up to you to draw the line between legitimate narcissism and self-indulgence. That's again quite subtle. It has happened. I remember very, very, very well a piece that I would never publish again. I would never want to see republished in an anthology where I got a lot out of an artist and, as, and out of a, of a work and I knew I knew there was something like I, it, I went too far and a friend of mine told me and I, it, it took that friend to tell me you've written a beautiful theoretical piece but you chose a mediocre artwork to, 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 to draw it from and so it, it, I think that the, the work must be stronger than the critic well, we'll come back to that. But this is the test. I did not render this artist a service by, by, by actually... And I see many of my art, by my friends, this is a critique to my colleagues here, you know, my colleague bashing. Let's do a little bit of colleague bashing. But in France, especially philosophers in France, they do critic, you know, they do political philosophy and all sorts of things. But everybody has to write on art someday. That's a, it's a typical French thing. Yeah, they, the philosophers are not specialists, but they, so they, they can write on anything. And uh, great philosophers, I, I'm, you know, even like Derrida, Lyotard, and these people, look at the artists on who they have written. It's the wrong artist all the time. It's the wrong artist. It's, it's like, and the theory that they get out of these artists is, is easily gotten out because it was already, sec, you know, second-hand work vis-à-vis -vis the real pioneer, and you want to deal with the real pioneer. But, oh, so I'm not blaming Lyotard and Derrida, who are wonderful thinkers and have done so many other brilliant things than writing on art. But when they write on art, it's not necessarily they're not necessarily picking the best artists. Now, am I saying that I always pick the best artists? Of course not. But I'm not the judge. You know, you made differently and I, I will disappear in the, what do you say, I would call that, the dustbin of history. <laughs> so, theory, a theoretical framework, a set of shared theoretical assumptions, a common theoretical language, these of course are other safeguards and the ones I rely on the most or the most consciously. But here several new risks arise. The main one, to me at least, being over-interpretation. As I said, when I interpret a work, I approach it with a theoretical question in mind. I was only half honest when I said it was the work itself that proffers the question. It would be truer to my experience to admit that most often than not, the question is prompted by theory. Though my rule of thumb or my postulate is that whatever theoretical thinking the word stirs up must be in the work. I obviously bring a lot of theory with me. I bring it from the books I've read, from years of study, from my own earlier work, whatever, a hell of a load. Theory is heavy, that's the problem. It carries the weight of all the important people you quote, or who are at the back of your mind when you write. It is laden with the sediments of their thinking. It has authority. And authority can too easily be used to empower yourself and to intimidate, to intimidate the reader and ultimately to silence the work. The risk of overinterpretation is that in lending the work the authority of theory, you end up crushing it under theory's power. Works of art stand fragile before a theoretical question. Not because they are intrinsically too frail for the confrontation. On the contrary, the better the art, 
the more theoretical questions it summons. But because they don't answer those questions in the language of theory, translation is necessary. The problems of translation and translatability put the finger right on the wound. This is where all the difficulties and risk of our criticism, as I see it, are compounded. So those difficulties start with the very first question I must ask myself. How do I know that a given work summons a given theoretical question? And that I'm not just bringing my current obsession to the work? There's no way I know that for a fact. I sense it, I feel it, I go at it intuitively, how else? The risk of self-delusion and narcissism is at its greatest here. The problem is not one of subjectivity versus objectivity. We have encountered that before again, and I already emphasized that, so I'm going to read that slowly because it's problematic and complex. The problem is not one of subjectivity versus objectivity. It is that the only road to the objectivity of theory, in art, I mean, not in science, of course, is a subjective control of the subjective use of theory. I simply have no one else at hand to keep my subjectivity in check. Least of all the theorists whom I quote and whose authority I invoke. For to be concerned with art theory as opposed to theory applied to art is to ask works of art to validate or invalidate a theoretical hypothesis either way. As in science, you must always be ready to abandon a theory, to change it, to make it move. As in art, however, you produce theory in your own name. You take personal responsibility for the theoretical thinking, the production of which you nevertheless ascribe to the works on which you are writing. This does what I personally call theory, but which I stubbornly refuse to call my personal theory, is nothing but the present state of the questions I ask myself, the questions for which I am ripe, and for which I preposterously assume that the world is ready. Here again, my, the ethical move is to trust those questions. That is, to trust that they aren't just mine. They are my link with other people's work. And when my questions are indeed shared by others, I find proof therein, objective proof this time, that I am not erring totally. So it's really, I think, an appeal to your community of peers to the people with whom you are in, in dialogue. I mean, you don't write for yourself alone, of course. You write to explain something to, it, to yourself, that's for sure, but you, you do want to publish it, so you want to share it with others and then let the discussion go on and contribute to the general debate. Now, back to Madonna's bed. Here I am with one or a number of theoretical questions in mind, addressing them to the work. At first, free association is the rule. The work, the general impression it gives me, the feelings it yields and how I name them, its thematic content, its form, its technique, shape and color, sometimes a single detail. All these evoke other works, put references out of my memory, call in others' commentary drive me to the library to consult books that I have a hint might contain a clue. I soon realize I'm not alone in bed with Madonna. Though I have nothing against group sex, the issue is now to keep a few partners in and let Madonna kick out of bed those who have nothing to do in there. In less metaphorical terms, I have to feel I have more interpretive material than I can use and that I can rely on the work to do the selection. Finding the way into the actual writing is sometimes immediate 
sometimes excruciatingly long. But if the first paragraph, even the first sentence, isn't something I sense I can return to in later, for, for latent meaning, I know that sooner or later I'll be stuck. This is very personal, but this is the way with me. If all goes well, I'm able to write. There are moments when the work I'm talking about is vividly present in my mind, and when the words I'm groping for need to stick to the work in meaning, in mood, in tonality, in intellectual precision. And there are moments when theoretical issues carry me miles from the work, often into an imaginary discussion with theoretical opponents. Never underestimate the polemical dimension of art writing, it is essential. But if you manipulate or simplify theory in order to knock down an opponent, or if you get seduced by your own words or your own theory to the point of betraying your aesthetic experience of the work, it shows. That's what happened to me when I wrote that elaborate piece on a mediocre artwork. Such is my own rule anyway. If I feel that I've been led astray by my desire to win an argument, or that I've followed the theoretical insight to a point where the theory overshadows the art, I assume that the reader will feel it too. This, of course, is only in those cases where I really am aware of what I've done. It may very well be that I do it all the time and I'm not aware of it, and you will correct me. Once again, it's a matter of ethics, but ethics might be to be the word. Let's say tact. The appropriate non-metaphor when it's all about touching and being touched. Tact is a striving after the right distance the distance at which the truth value of your theoretical interpretation hinges on the justness of your aesthetic judgment. If you're too much in love and your readers feel they can agree with you with your theoretical interpretation only if they adhere unconditionally to your aesthetic judgment, you're too close. If your relation to the work is a one-night stand on the basis of which you concoct a whole theory that readers feel you could have constructed at the hand of virtually any other work as well, then you're too far away. Finally, if you manage to convey the impression that you have cracked the enigma of the work, ripped open its secrets, said all there was to say about it, then you're doomed. Either it's true in which case you shouldn't have written about the work in the first place, because it's too banal. Or it's not, and you lose your readers. They want art to resist interpretation, and they're right. The real issue about translatability turns out to be untranslatability. Good theoretically inclined art criticism should achieve two contradictory goals at the same time. It should seek theoretical enlightenment, and it should respect the work's enigma, its resistance to the language of theory, its otherness. Though the drive behind my work as a critic theorist is to discover what I sense the art knows that I don't, and to translate that into the language of theory, my aim is not to violate the work's secret, but to circumscribe it with a tight network of tangents and make it appear right there in the middle, as if in a clearing, yet as dark as ever. The work's enigma is my blind spot. If I can see it now, I've learned something. I understand that I've simply displaced it elsewhere, if I understand I've simply displaced it elsewhere to wherever the next theoretical question will come from, I've learned a lot more. For I haven't forgotten that objects don't think. To produce theoretical thought from the work is to start from the feeling that the work thinks and knows something, and moving from that feeling to probe the work with a theoretical question. Then to let theoretical labor answer the question and produce knowledge. You see, I've used the word produce knowledge after all. And produce knowledge. 
and then to check again with my feelings as to whether the knowledge I've gained sounds pertinent, whether it strikes the right note, whether it resonates, and so on, back and forth. That's what I called earlier the interplay between dialogue and intercourse, and would now call thinking theoretically on the aesthetic road. Thinking theoretically on the aesthetic road. You use the knowledge you gain from the feelings the work gives you, it's called insight or intuition, in order to produce theory. And you use the feelings you have about the knowledge you produced in order to check its relevance to the work. So you see, it's It's, it's a strange thing. It's a strange thing. I think that even in the hard sciences it may sometimes happen. Like when mathematicians are so excited because they found a beautiful formula. You realize that? It's not just that it's correct. It has to be elegant. It has to be beautiful. And that is very often a sign that, that there's some truth in it. I, you can't explain that in fact. You, you cannot explain it, because, because the feeling of elegance is just a feeling also. There is no objective criteria of elegance. So then there is this thing. And then I, I continue, because I, I guess I, I must comment on that a little bit. Feelings and knowledge don't mix. That is both an ethical and an epistemological rule, as far as I'm concerned. Because I know that pe some people think they, they do mix. I think feelings and knowledge don't mix and it has aesthetic consequences. When I write, there always comes a point where my main concern is the form that the piece will take. Here we are. Though what I want to say determines how I want to say it, it is the how that shapes the what. Speed, rhythm, tone, echoes, choice of words, construction of sentences, length of paragraphs, all matter enormously where to shift gears abruptly, how to alternate emotion with cool argumentation, where to be academic and where to be colloquial and so on. These are the means with which I try to weave the theoretical threads I hold in my hands into a fabric of some consistency and pliancy, while purposefully leaving some of them dangling. All these decisions, which are aesthetic, belong, in my opinion, to the subject matter the written piece. I want them to contribute to the labor of extracting knowledge from the work of art under discussion. Yet, they should have a life of their own. At stake is to expose the work's enigma qua enigma, i.e., to make that enigma visible, to make it somehow aesthetically perceptible to others. Most art critics and theorists probably proceed similarly. I don't think I've described anything exception. I wouldn't have insisted on this aesthetic dimension of art writing if, I hadn't, if it hadn't been for this exercise in critical reflection and also, I suppose, if I hadn't been for my friend Roslyn Krupp's amicable blame OTM it's really just like an artist. Now, I, I don't really believe her. Artists, I suspect, too bad they are not here start the dialogue, but I'm sure there are artists in the room so we can, we can begin discussing this. Artists, I suspect, not being an artist, don't operate in exactly this way. Aside from the fact that all artists don't operate in the same way, I believe the mode of thinking embodied in a work of art is extraneous to the theoretical mode, extraneous even to what I just called thinking theoretically on the aesthetic Though artists may sometimes speak the language of theory, they don't in their work. How do I know? Again, I have no proof. Again, it's a matter of otherness and untranslatability. All I know is that the work's enigma is my blind spot. And my blind spot isn't necessarily the work's enigma. I can't assume that what presents itself to me as a theoretical stumbling block 
has presented itself in the same way to the person whose thinking process the work embodies. It's not just that art isn't totally translatable into theory. It's that the issue of untranslatability isn't the same from the vantage point of the critic and from the vantage point of the artist. And I don't have the vantage point of the artist at my disposal. That's the trouble. I can only surmise. The best approximation I've found is to say that the way artists seem to think in their work is akin to the mythical mode of thought of the pre-Socratic thinkers, say, at the time of Parmenides' poem, just before the rift between poetry and philosophy. This is embarrassing to suggest, less because it makes the thinking of artists seem so archaic, than because it automatically puts me in the position of a rational philosopher for whom the pre-Socratic mode of thinking is already in irredeemably lost. Traditore, traditore. Being couched in and thus translated into the words of someone familiar with theory, philosophy in this case, my approximation is already a betrayal of the artist's mode of thought and thus an avowal of my definitive blindness. Two last things. First, the worst self delusion for a critic is to believe you can put the vantage point of an artist at your disposal by interviewing him or her. And second, the greatest challenge for a critic is that artists can talk back. The one relevant difference, according to me, between art criticism and art history, whether theoretically inclined or not, is that art critics write on living artists, whereas art historians write on dead artists. Well, the rule I apply to myself is to neglect that difference as much as I can. I must write as if the living artist were dead and the work severed from its maker belonged to art history. Now, I won't pretend that I never interview artists or that I don't make use of what artists have said to others. I may even have abused such source material as it is, it is unfittingly called. But I don't necessarily take what artists say to represent their vantage points. I'm more, or I try, I should say, I try to be more like a Lacanian psychoanalyst listening to the signifier. To talk about the artist's work is to relate what the work says about itself and about other things to what the artist says about the work and other things. To interview the artist, exchanging small talk, information or opinions or even discussing theory with the artist is one thing. Like all human exchanges, this one rests on the convention that is partly the illusion, that vantage points are interchangeable. To communicate to the artist what I've written about the artist's work is an altogether different thing. It is a face-to-face -face in which we both stare at each other's otherness, an unmediated face-to-face, -face, even though two objects, the artist's work and my text, lie between us, pretending to be vessels of communication. The work was not addressed to me in particular, but when I felt that it called me and that it had something theoretical to teach me, I acknowledged receipt of it as if it had been addressed to me. And my text is not addressed to the artist either. Fortunately, most artists want to know what's written about their work. I fear and love this. It's a real test. I don't consider myself to have passed the test successfully if the artist agrees with my interpretation of the work. That's not the point. But I'm happiest when the artist feels compelled to talk back with words or with works, in this I find the sign that I haven't heard totally. 
the sign, not the proof, just the sign. Thank you.